have the pleasure to introduce your first speaker today. Uh, Ron Navas is a system architect with more than 10 years of experience in performing and implementing systems engineering practices in industrial organizations. He currently leads the teams as supporting managers and architects to implement MBC approaches and operational projects, helping them to define their engineering schemes, objectives, and guidelines. So welcome, Ron. Uh, glad you're opening this first virtual couple of days, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Samuel. Um, thank you very much all for being here. Um, my talk is called Model-Based Systems Engineering with Arcadia and Capella, reconciling with the past and moving towards the future. Um, and uh, my objective is to, is to talk to you about uh, two uh, methodological uh, improvements that we have made this, the last few years uh, and share with you what we, ha we have done uh, on this uh, aspect. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed by the number of, of people registered to the Capella Days this year. Uh, 767 people is, is, is really, really impressive. Um, it's, I'm pretty sure it's people with different levels of maturity on model-based systems engineering uh, on Arcadia and Capella. Uh, there's great people sharing their feedback with us, uh, Siemens, uh, Virgin Hyperloop, to name just one of two of them. Uh, people that are begin, beginning their path uh, to model-based systems engineering, people that discover model-based systems engineering, and um, I mean, very welcome to this community. And there is, I'm pretty sure, people with different backgrounds. Uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of mostly, I mean, systems engineers, systems architects, surely methods and tool uh, leaders, uh, but more and more people from software, from hardware, from integration, verification and validation, from safety, human factors, engineering managers, cybersecurity, etc. And this is quite interesting as we see that the number and the variety of people involved in complex systems engineering is increasing dramatically. In fact, this is not, this is not new or not at all. Uh, this chart shows the growth of the number of design requirements for aerospace vehicles until the 90s. And indirectly, it also presents new, how new concerts have been taken into account in design, uh, which also implies the stronger involvement of, of specialists in these concerns. This trend continued in the past years as new concerns such as cybersecurity, user experience, and resilience become more and more relevant. As a consequence, the achievement of the Wright brothers, that were I mean, only two guys that invented, designed, built, test, and I mean, flying the world's first successful motor operated airplane is no longer possible. In fact, aerospace engineering today rather looks like this, uh, meaning hundreds or even thousands of people of high skill, skilled engineers uh, working together at the same time in different places of the world for the same purpose. Rather than one or two genius, modern complex systems engineering requires a collective intelligence. Rather than having one genius brain, we need to connect a lot of great brains to build a brain of many brains. This collective intelligence means the capability to collectively understand, learn, reason, plan, and solve problems. It means for a member of the engineering team, to be able to perceive or infer information coming from other people and to retain it as knowledge to be applied under other circumstances and do it all this very, very quickly. In fact, this is very similar to what a nervous system does. Neurons have the special structures that allow them to send signals rapidly and precisely to other cells. And they can communicate at very fast pace to ensure that the system as a whole perceives, reason, and act based on precise information. Similarly, in our engineering, we need to enable production cons and consumption of the right information by the right person for the right use at the right time. This approach of engineering that relies on the collective intelligence is called digital engineering. And models are key enablers of digital engineering. They provide consistent sources of truth. They provide digital representation of the system across life cycle stages, and they enable communication and collaboration across stakeholders. The digital engineering vision requires to operate changes on the way we perform engineering. 
to switch from a document-based way of working to data and information-based practices and process. This implies strong changes on the culture of org or organizations and its workforce. Change is difficult, but not to change may be fatal. Or as is commonly attributed to Charles Darwin, the ones that survive are the ones that are able to best to adapt and adjust to the changing environment in which they find themselves. So the question here is how to adapt and adjust the implementation of model-based systems engineering practices to the changing environment in which our engineering organizations evolve? And there is no simple answer for this question as it strongly depends on your own context, the type of practices you want to implement, the characteristics of your model-based capabilities, the organization you need to change, among other factors. But the history of the humankind provides us some principles that can be used in many contexts and that we used in Thales. The first principle is called reconciling with the past. And to illustrate it, I will take as an example the incredible spread of Christianism in the world during the first centuries of our era. Christianism has adopted, adapted and replaced many symbols, practices and holidays that existed already. One of them is the Christmas holiday, the nativity of Jesus. At the time Christianity emerged in the first and second centuries of our era, December 25, was already a holiday in the Egyptian mythology, because there is a god called Osiris, um, Persian mythology as well, Mitra, god, Greek mythology, Apollon, and Jewish, Jewish, uh, as there was already Hanukkah holiday. These past practices were not remo removed by Christianity. They were rather adapted to suit better to the new, new religion. So the habits of the newcomers didn't need to be changed dramatically. The second principle is to embrace the future. In the second century, Christianity was not the only emerging religion. And in fact, other cults were more popular, but Christianism promised things that were expected by the people at that time. It promised the resurrection of bodies and the happiness after death. It promoted a doctrine of love and equality among all men that seduced the people. And the stronger mutual aid of Christian communities during plagues could explain their better survival rates, which was seen as a miracle by the pagans, which contributed to the development of conversions. These novelties brought by Christianity made it attractive to the people, progressively touching, touching all social layers of the Roman Empire. It was only at the fourth century that the Christian religion was considered as the official religion of the empire. But most of the change management job was already done at, this, at that time. We will see now how we apply these two principles when implementing model-based systems engineering with Arcadia and Capella in our organization. We apply the reconciling with the past principle regarding models and textual requirements. And we apply the embracing the future principle regarding agility and the use of models. So let's start with models and textual requirements. Textual requirements, meaning shawl statements, have been the backbone of traditional systems engineering practices for decades. Most of our practices are based on them. When companies decide to implement systems engineering, they usually start by adopting requirements engineering practices. The fact that they are based on natural language has contributed to generalization of these practices. However, although they bring a lot of value, Textual requirements have also drawbacks. It often drives to an explosion of the number of requirements, making them difficult to understand as a whole, and making difficult to ensure the consistency and the completeness of the sets of requirements. Furthermore, they are supposed to be atomic, which again, where there is a high number of requirements, make them difficult to understand as a whole. In model-based systems engineering, we have completed textual requirements with two types of models the needs and context models, which help formalize and consolidate the stakeholders and system requirements, and that most often correspond to the operational analysis and the system needs analysis perspective of Arcadia and Capella. And the solution models, which helps validate feasibility 
and elicit and justify new textual requirements for the system and subsystems, and that most often correspond to the logical and physical architecture perspectives of Arcadia and Capella. So as models rely on a precise language or meta model, they add rigor by significantly reducing ambiguities. And because they obey strict construction rules, models can be automatically processed and analyzed. Among others, this allows to ensure completeness and consistency. So if models are more formal and rigorous than requirements, why aren't they considered as requirements themselves? This is exactly the thesis of the paper that we presented at the INCOSI International Symposium in 2019, last year, and that was granted the best MBSC paper award. It presented a major finding to advance our model-based systems engineering practice. Requirements are at the center of all our engineering activities, and requirements can either be, text, be textual shell statements, either model elements. Textual and model requirements actually complete each other. In some cases, model requirements will be more expressive than textual ones. In others, they will, will be the opposite. And in others, they will live together. What are the criteria? Let's consider some kinds of requirements we find in our projects. Let's consider first the case on which model elements are requirements. Functional requirements describe inputs, outputs, transformations. Arcadia includes concepts such as functions and functional chains that can be considered as functional requirements. Similarly, component exchanges or interfaces can be considered as interfaces requirements. Performances state how well the functions shall perform. They can be represented as property values or domain-specific properties. But keep in mind that even if some model elements are requirements, not all model elements are requirements. There are some cases in which model and textual requirements will live together. In some cases, model requirements can formalize textual requirements and make explicit its effects on ramifications. For instance, input cost customer requirements can be formalized through models, mod mods, or state machines. In other cases, textual requirements will complete the model. Some expectations, like an environment or regulation expectations, are easier to express with textual descriptions with traceability links to model elements. Finally, in some cases, stakeholders' textual requirements can be led as this, as they are led to be addressed by the subsystems during their own architectural design process. A benefit of this approach is to have more solid and consistent co-engineering between engineering levels. Most of our projects developing complex systems have multiple engineering levels, system levels, subsystems, components level. The transfer of knowledge between engineering levels and the understanding of the requirements of each level, starting from the customer, of course, has always been pain points on the engineering process. Using models as the central artifact for contracts between engineering levels, and hence between engineering teams, whether they are in the same organization or not, bring clarity and rigor to this. The expectations at the engineering level N are formalized using a needs and context model. The contribution of the subsystem are formalized through solution models that cover all the expectations. A good practice here is to involve subsystems engineers during this task. The needs and context model of the subsystem can be automatically generated, and along with complementary textual requirements, they are the contract of what is expected by the subsystem. Consequently, the engineering level N plus one has a well-specified and justified contract to develop this, subs this subsystem. Another benefit of this approach is to have more solid, consistent, and fluid co-engineering between systems engineering and integration, verification, and validation teams. As some model elements are considered as the requirements, we can align verification and validation artifacts against the model requirements instead of associating test procedures directly to test or textual requirements, they verify scenarios and functional chains. Each step of a functional chain becomes a step in the test procedure. Verification and validation engineers and system engineers 
can hence work in a, on a common reference. And similarly, the alignment between verification and validation campaigns and system increments becomes straightforward. It's easy to precisely compute the functions, components, and interfaces that are necessary for one validation campaign simply by performing queries on the model. Let's go to the second principle, which is embracing the future, and is it regards um, the implementation of agility in a model-based approach. We know that models enable a consistent and complete expression of both the needs and the context of operation of the system. And the expectations of the system and components are that are part of the solution. We also know that agility is recognized as a key property of systems engineering. And here agility is understood as the capability to adapt to new circumstances, the capability of our engineering teams to adapt to new circumstances, new context of operations, new technologies, new customer demands. So why not considering them together? This is the subject of the paper that we presented at the last INCOS International Symposium this year. We stated that model-based practices are effective enablers of systems engineering agility. They allow us to design systems in an incremental way based on value creation using end-to-end -end functional chains and scenario. How is this done? The approach is based on defining an incremental engineering strategy based by the milestones of the project. For each increment, engineering teams pass through three model-based tasks, warm-up, run, and evaluate. Warm-up is the collaborative definition of the detailed scope, goals, and schedule of the increment and of the necessary resources, ensuring that the conditions required to perform next iterations without danger are met. For instance, are the expectations of the increment well-defined? Are the system capabilities sufficiently well-defined? Are all enabling systems available? Run is an iterative effort punctuated by iteration reviews. The number and length of the iterations is not fixed. This may be also the case for warm up is, in fact. Typically, the run phase will implement the capabilities of the system or component that were identified in the scope of work on the warm up, warm up phase. The evaluate task assess how the engineering was performed, that the expected outcomes are there, and that the conditions for pursuing are met. In this example, during the warm-up, mostly architecture and design activities are performed in order to define the scope of the following increments. The scope of work is defined using the concepts defined by the Arcadia method, both at the needs and solution perspectives. Here, the scope is defined in terms of the capabilities of the system, for instance, this capability visualizes data in life during flight, each capability is described by a certain amount of usage context, which here are captured in functional chains. Functional chains are dispatched in different increments that will be further specified and developed in dedicated iterations. Run steps complete the architecture and design work and progressively Im implements and integrate, verify, and validate the capabilities and deploys the updates of those already operational. The system team, per team performs a vertical slice of engineering. It formalizes the need and describes the required updates in the solution model. Representative members of the software and IDD teams participate to regular reviews of the increment data package currently built by the systems team. Their role is to anticipate the feasibility and to make sure the system level vision of the solution is compatible with the current software architecture. Particip participation of software architects to the co-engineering effort at system level is key for the software developers to accept the models they will receive from the systems architects. Once the software teams receive the data package, it works primarily on it and it organizes itself to develop it. They will define short sprints on which they will develop, develop the software and deliver the functionalities to the IVV teams. The IVV teams, integrate the components delivered by the software team every third week, for instance, and runs the test procedures written during the previous iteration. In parallel, software and IDV teams contribute to the next increment of the architectural design that is led by the systems team. Finally, the evaluation phase 
which is not shown here, faces the validated scopes and a scope and updates the architecture and design definition. Well, what are the benefits of this approach? First, better collaboration, organization, and progress monitoring by using architectural models as the common reference between engineering teams. In this approach, the architectural models become the blueprint that all teams can understand and based on which they define the scope of work of each increment and iteration. This ultimately enables a better collaboration between engineering teams. Another benefit is that, I mean, this approach is a concrete example of the I'm building a cathedral story. You know the, the story, um, the difference between considering that you are simply cutting stones, which is like writing some software code, and or considering that you are building a cathedral. The use of end-to-end -end functional chains provide meaning to what software developers are doing with all the happy consequences that this has on taking into account user experience or avoiding avoiding and fixing bugs. Well, this, these two methodological, methodological uh, advances are only, I mean, some examples of the methodological advances we have made in the, in the past years. And on the examples of how these change management principles uh, can be applied to, to perform the change and the implementation of these uh, digital engineering practices in, um, in, in, in large organizations like ours. But the road to digital engineering is in front of us. And there are a lot of topics that we have we will have to address in the future. And I mean, to, to talk only about two of them, there is the issue of how to enhance an effective collaboration around models. Um, I mean, collaboration between engineering teams and people that are not necessarily in the engineering context and the engineering teams and are not even engineers. Um, collaboration in terms of practices and engineering environments. Um, and there's another topic, for instance, that is how to address new concerns, uh, for instance, such as cybersecurity, how to um, integrate the concern of cybersecurity when defining the architectural, um, the architecture of the system, and how to, um, to monitor the cybersecurity constraints during the whole life cycle stage uh, of the system. So there are, there are many, many topics, but the road of the digital engineering is in front of us. And I hope that with the help of the members of the Capella community, we will hit the road with success. Uh, before leaving the room and letting some time for questions, uh, just a few words about this week. There are a bunch of great presentations on many industrial fields. Uh, I highly recommend not to miss any of them. They are, they are all quite interesting. And in particular, tomorrow afternoon, my colleagues from Thales will talk about what's going on in terms of development of Capella and about a brand new organization and website that we will launch tomorrow that will be called the Labs for Capella. It will be a place to bring to together Capella users and what we could call the laboratories, meaning the developers of new features of Capella. I won't tell you more, uh, but don't miss the presentation tomorrow afternoon. I think it's 4.45 uh, European time. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm open to, um, to questions. OK, thanks, Juan. Uh, was a quite good of a thing. Um, yes, we, indeed, we have got time for questions, uh, 15 minutes. Actually, uh, we have one question. Uh, will the mentioned paper uh, also be shared? The mentioned papers, you mean? Yes. Um, th these papers are these papers are available for um, for Incosi members. Uh, so if you are Incosi member. Um, you, you, you have access to, normally you should have access to these papers. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I guess in the future we will be able to share uh, these papers in the Capella website uh, while we get clear of the copyright uh, issues. And uh, um, 
and in, in any case, if you really, I mean, if you're hurried uh, and you want to do the paper right now, you can you can write me and I I'm, I, can, I will be able to to share it. Okay, thanks. Um, can you explain a little better how agile can be integrated with the Arcadia methodology? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the key the key element uh, in in I mean implementing agility in in I mean in a model based approach. By, I mean, as the one that is uh, recognized by Arcadia uh, method and, and Capella tool. Uh, is, is maybe is the capability concept. The capability concept is uh, is I mean the system capability concept to represent the high level services that can be provided by the system uh, to the different users and other stakeholders. So it's a very high level concept that is really I mean is really related with the notion of value value that is provided by the um, to the stakeholders, which is a key concept in agility independently of the frameworks the agile frameworks that do may be used uh may be using like i mean safe or scrum or whatever um in fact in in this paper we really wanted to uh, to be agnostic to the um to all these uh different frameworks and approaches to to perform agility uh, first of all because all most of them are devoted to uh, to software systems or I mean, to, to really and pure software systems, which are not necessarily, I mean, they don't have necessarily the same characteristics of complex systems. And secondly, because, I mean, we really want it to be, um, to be applicable to, to in, in many contexts, even if people are using the, uh, these uh, frameworks. Um, so by, by using this concept capability and two other concepts that are strongly related to the capabilities, which are the functional chains and the scenarios, which in fact describe the capabilities, um, we are able to uh, to relate what are the needs, what is the value that is provided uh, to the user and the and the other stakeholders, and the contribution of the components of the system. And this contribution of the components of the system ultimately is what software developers or hardware developers will um, will will be will be dealing with. So it's really the, uh, the the concept that is like the bridge uh, between uh, agility at the system level and agility at the components. I mean, especially software uh, components level. Okay, thanks, Juan. Uh, I'm looking for the, the the question with the most votes. Maybe this one. Do you think it's possible or desirable to work without textual requirements? And to move to a 100% model-based approach. Just before you answered, uh, I would like to just to remind to your attendee that they can directly use the Ask Question tool in bottom of their screen. It would be much more easier for me uh, to to administrate the questions. Thanks. Can you can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, do you think is it possible or desirable? To work without textual requirements, only with models. I mean, um, it, it. I mean, it could be done. Uh, in fact, there is a very interesting paper that I read. Uh, it was in the, the Systems Engineering Journal, uh, end of 2019, I think. Uh, which, I mean, the main idea of the paper was to show how, I mean, could we could get rid of uh, of textual requirements and only use models. Um, it, it could be done. I mean, theoretically, I, I don't think there is a, there is a, um, a barrier uh, to do so. But in practice, and this is what we have seen, uh, I mean, working with the projects, what we see in the projects, even the projects that have most advanced uh, model-based systems engineering practices still use textual requirements. Uh, and that's why, because th th there, are, there are some requirements that are really way easier to um to to identify to trace uh to describe uh using natural language um specifically regulation requirements uh environment requirements and there are others uh, that are like a mix of them for performance requirements could be included in the model but sometimes it's easier to consider them as textual requirements with traceability so it's it's really i mean the, the approach that we 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 propose in this in the paper that I, I talked about is is really a pragmatic approach. Uh, it's not about okay, 
let's let's do all only models is not the idea uh the idea is to to share what i mean what is going on what what people are doing uh in their own projects and in particular most advanced uh, model-based systems engineering practices, I mean, advanced model-based practices uh, in our projects. I mean, the projects that have the most advanced practices, they all still use TechSource requirements. So theoretically, it's possible. Pragmatically speaking, um, there there's still some, some work to be done uh, in order to, if models want to uh, to have the same, I would say, um, easiness of, uh, of, um, of writing uh, requirements as textual requirements. Okay, thanks, Juan. Uh, next question. Do you have an example showing O2 model cybersecurity features using Capella? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, are, there are examples that I, I mean, it would be difficult to, um, to, to talk um, a lot about it. Uh, I mean, it, I could talk a lot about it, and we have only a few minutes left. Um, but no, no, but I will, I will provide some, some, some. I, I will provide some, some, uh, some ideas. Um, uh, cybersecurity is. Um, I mean, is, there are some concepts in cybersecurity that clearly uh, are related to the to the definition of of architectures. Uh, for instance, in cybersecurity, when we talk about assets. Uh, meaning, I mean, um, with what is called in some referentials primary assets, uh, which means the, the the information or the services that need to be protected because they provide value uh, to the stakeholders, including our own company, uh, but of course the customer. Uh, these these assets are clearly represented in the architecture, and there is a lot of things that we could analyze uh, from the cybersecurity point of view in the architecture once we have identified these assets. For instance, the information, how the information is flowing in the architecture, and how this information could be protected against some threats. Uh, how this service is represented in the, in the architecture, for instance, using functional chains or capabilities, of course, um, um and um and yeah so once you define these assets you can map and find the footprint of these assets in the architecture in order to identify which are the components that you will need to protect and how to protect them against the attacks that your system may suffer um if, if you are interested there, there is a, also an art, uh, a paper that we we published uh, last year in the COSI symposium, uh, which was um, a first, some first ideas about how to handle the cybersecurity um, concern uh, with uh, with Arcadia and Capella. Uh, so it's again, I don't, I don't think it's, it's public uh, yet, but again, if you are interested, you can contact me and you, I can share uh, the paper with you. Okay, thanks. And uh, the next question, which will be probably the, the last one due to the timing. Um, I have to say that we have had a lot of votes for this one. Uh, mapping, sorry, mapping textual requirements to functions imply many decisions. Uh, so how can iterations be organized? Uh, what about non-functional requirements to the whole system? I mean, I'm not pretty sure. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the last part of the question. Sorry. Um, the last sentence is: What about non-functional requirements to the whole system? I'm not sure about. Yeah. No, no, I, I see. Non-functional non requirements behind behind the concept non-functional requirements. I mean, if I ask two engineers to define it, I will find. I mean, if I ask ten engineers to define it, I will have almost ten different definitions. So non-functional. I mean, it's everything that is not functional. So first, define what is functional requirements. Functional requirements are relations between inputs and outputs. Uh, so everything that is not relation uh, between inputs and outputs would be the non-functional requirements. And there are a lot of non-functional requirements. There are domain-specific requirements. Resilience requirements could be defined as non-functional requirements. Cybersecurity requirements could be defined as some cybersecurity requirements could be defined as non-functional requirements. So uh, in, in many cases, when we work with these non-functional requirements of the whole system, uh is it's like first we will need to to refine 
uh, these requirements. Uh, when we, we re receive these textual requirements from the customer, such as, for instance, the system shall conform with this uh, standard, well, we will need to, to take a look at the standard and identify what are the sub requirements that we'll need to, to really, I mean, to are really applicable to the system, and then uh, identify what are the components of the system uh, that are uh, concerned by this requirement. So this is an example of the kind of requirements that most often, not always, but most often are still considered in our project as, as textual requirements. But keeping in mind that we will, I mean, we really insist on defining the traceability links um, between these textual requirements and the components that are concerned by these requirements. For instance, if you say that all the cabinets in your system shall be painted in red, well, you can you can see that probably it will apply to a large amount of components of your system, but probably not all of them. So uh, important thing is to to keep the digital what is called the digital thread, uh, meaning the traceability links that will allow you later to justify that your system that is delivered, but on, also your design, the design of your system is um, is is, is, I mean, is conforms with the uh, customer requirements.